um, me, um, following which we'll have Q&A, which I'll chair through. And so if anyone has any questions or comments, please do uh, take the opportunity in the chat boxes to insert your questions. Even if they're during the presentations, we can keep an eye on it, but we'll pick those questions up at the end. Um, or during the Q&A time, do feel free to raise your hands, but I'll go over some of these procedures then as well. So for now, I would hand this over to Marvin and to you. Great, thank you, Gunshan, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, and thank you um, for organizing this, um, this workshop, this, this seminar, uh, and the seminar series as a whole. I thought it's, it's, a, it's a really um, helpful seminar um, um, to be sharing with uh, our colleagues uh, back home uh, in the Philippines. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, how we communicate local scholarship. Uh, with international audiences. And I think um, a part of, of much of what I will be talking about today would most likely be informed by, um, by my own politics as a, as a post-colonial scholar. You know, I'm, I'm originally from the Philippines, um, now in Singapore, I, and I've been, uh, I've traveled around, but, but I, my, my heart is still very much close to the Philippines. Um, I do a bit of work in uh, different parts of the region as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so much of my research is really, um, you know, um, focused on the Philippines, um, and um, and you know, I continue to develop my my scholarship uh, in that particular geographic region. Okay, so um, I thought about um, you know when I was thinking about what to talk about today. I, I was actually sort of in a moral pickle, right? In a sense that, you know, um, uh, part of my identity as a post-colonial scholar is, is kind of making me ask the question, um, to what extent do we really have to communicate local scholarship with international audiences? Um, but at the same time, I, I do see the importance of, of doing this. Okay. So, um, so one of the um, so so I thought that maybe before we begin, I, I would just like to kind of um, contextualize um, the whole presentation by sort of um, asking the question first of what is what is the local and what is the international, right? And kind of making a distinction between the two and kind of compare and to a certain uh, and compare and contrast. Um, and so uh, I'm I'm going to talk about first. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to talk about first um, uh, how and what academia looks like um, outside the Philippines, and and of course this is not you know all encompassing of academia outside the Philippines, uh, and I would say a part of this is also um, existent in the Philippines, but but here I'm probably describing more uh, what I would probably refer to as kind of privileged academia. Right, so so um, uh, the the kind of academia that is uh, very much dominating much of um, academic discourse these days, you know, uh, and 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 I say privilege because they have much of the resources uh, to 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 do their scholarship, right? And and I'll talk a bit more about this, but you're all probably familiar with this term, right? Uh, publish or or perish. And, uh, and, and much of, of privileged academia is, is very much now kind of embroiled in this situation where, where your, um, your uh, uh, performance as an academic is primarily premised on your capacity to publish your work and research. Right. Um, next slide, please. And so, you know, when, when we're talking about, I'm not really gonna uh, spend a lot of time uh, talking about this, but I thought that maybe some of our colleagues uh, in the Philippines and, and perhaps in, in other uh, uh, geographies <coughs> this seminar at the moment would, would uh, find, find this information useful and interesting. Um, and, and so when we're talking about, you know, how privileged academia operates, um, so it's essentially, you know, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the quality uh, uh, and and um, and the quantity of the stuff that you publish, right? And when I say quality, there's 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 a, a uh, there's a, a ranking that that you sort of follow, 
right? So there are se several databases. For example, here I'm showing the Web of Science journal citation reports, which basically shows sort of the, the ranking of the journals uh, in, in, um, um, in, in specific fields. So I think for this one, if I'm not mistaken, this is, this is on development studies, right? So, so it's ranked according to the number of citations. So meaning the number of people, a number of studies that cite um, articles that are published in these uh, specific journals. All right, uh, next slide, please. And so there is this, um, uh, you know, because of this infra infrastructure now that has been established in terms of, of uh, you know, ranking uh, and, 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 and standardizing and in, in, in some ways kind of putting some form of, of, um, of definition of what the quality means, right? Uh, that translates to, um, uh, the kinds of expectations that are imposed on academics. And, and, and now as a scholar, for example, uh, you know, you can go to the web of science and then you can, you can type somebody's name, for example, there and then check that person's um, academic performance, right, in terms of publishing. And I, I, here I gave us an example, June Boreas, who's a, a really well-known Filipino scholar who does agrarian studies, really, really well-respected. A scholar and, and and if you kind of look at the right at the right hand side of the um the screen right you'll see metrics and so the metrics there you'll see like number of citations right there's this thing called h index which essentially is like the number of citation in relation to the number of articles that you publish meaning that if you have a 33 Right, that means that you have 33 publications with at least 33 citations. Right, so so it has become more and more elaborate, you know, um, over the last uh, few years, and 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 this has really become uh, you know a serious uh, set of of um, metrics that that uh, becomes quite important when uh, when an institution, for example, considers you for promotion. Right or whether they will give you tenure or whether you know, for example, whether uh, you will transition from a, a, a contractual position to something that is more permanent, right? So, so in in much of privileged academia, this is this has become the norm. Um, next slide, please. And I guess this is sort of um, associated with. Um, uh, you know, the kinds of resources that are available in, in these institutions, right? So it, at the National University of Singapore, for example, uh, you know, our access to, um, to publications, to, to scholarship uh, published uh, around the world, right? It's, re it's really remarkable in many ways, right? Uh, we have, I think, one of the highest, um, if I'm not mistaken, the highest uh, or the largest collection of volumes of published material in, in Asia, right? And, 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 and because of that, right, it's, it's relatively easier for us, for us academics who are uh, in, based here in, in Singapore, at the National University of Singapore, uh, to do our research, right? And, and to be conversing with uh, academics, uh, other academics uh, in other parts of the world, right? Uh, it's, you know, um, it's so easy for us to access journals, for instance. Right. And um, uh, back home in the Philippines, that's not the case. Right. So even if we go to, say, um, some of the top institutions in the Philippines, like the University, University of the Philippine system, right, uh, they do have limited access to online journals, but not all uh, not all journals are available. Right. So in, in fact, you know, um, it's still quite limited. Um, if you go to De La Salle University, so I worked there for about a year, it's a really well endowed university in the Philippines, but still not the same level and not the same, quite the same level of, of, of accessibility to uh, research material published around the world, right? So there is, there's a difference, there's a significant difference between what, what we have back home in the Philippines and, and what other institutions uh, in, in many other parts of the world um, are able to access. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. 
uh, and of course, it's related to um, uh, fundings, uh, uh, research funding as well, right? Um, so the access to journals uh, and, and published materials around the world um, goes hand in hand uh, with access to research funds. So this is the amount of, of funding that's available here in Singapore. For instance, we're talking about like uh, the figure here says 628 um, million dollars, right? So that roughly translates to close to 23 billion pesos, right? Of yearly budget just for research. And that's just, that's a huge amount of money, right? As compared to what we have back home. Um, uh, when I was in the La Salle University, for instance, um, I remember the highest funding that you can get from the institution was something close to about a million pesos. Right, which is roughly around twenty thousand U.S. dollars, right? And 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 here in Singapore, you know, that sort of money is considered to be the lowest tier of funding that you can get from the government, right? So so again, you see that disparity in terms of of the availability of resources. So again, I'm, I'm sort of just contextualizing my my uh, my talk here. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So this is the, the library. Uh, uh, in the University, University of the Philippines. Um, you know, I studied in UP Diliman. I did my bachelor's there. And during my time, we hardly had any access to, to journals, really. And, um, and, and even digital, digital versions of that, right? So, so when I uh, did my master's here in Singapore, I was really just amazed that everything is just, you know, uh, away, right? So you just go to the website of the library, and you can get access to you know, millions of journal articles that are um, available online, right? The other uh, amazing thing as well, and, and I, I'm saying this because I'm recognizing our privilege that we are spoiled um, scholars in many ways. Here, right, there's a system uh, in the libraries here called uh, ILL, right? Which, is, which, uh, which translates to um, interlibrary loan. So essentially, if there are material, for example, that's not available in Singapore, um, then uh, you could request the library to search uh, uh, where these materials are available in other parts of the world. And they would send a request to the libraries uh, that hold these materials to send over the, the material to Singapore, right? And everything is paid for by the library system here in Singapore. So, so when I was doing my research, for example, so I'm collaborating with somebody who does um, uh, research on uh, climate change um, and food security in the Philippines, and we were uh, getting hold of um, archival material um, um, in, in mostly in libraries in the United States, and, and some are in, in uh, Western Europe. And, um, and these are weather reports, right? And, and, um, and as expected, I mean, amazingly, these weather reports are actually not available in the Philippines, but these weather reports are reports of, of weather patterns in the Philippines, right? That goes all the way back uh, to the early 1900s, right? So, so all we had to do was go to our library and make that request, right? And, and essentially these libraries then just sent all of these materials and many of them are already in these, uh, uh, you know, are, are, were put in carts and many of them are already yellowing, right? So you just imagine um, reports that are uh, close to about a century old, right? And they're just being transported from one country to another, right? Um, and, and we got the material within less than three weeks, if I'm not mistaken, right? So again, that's, that's part of the privilege, right? That we, we, we don't have in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so, so you know, given that context, right, and, um, and one of the things, and, and my task here is, is to help us think about the question of, uh, first is, is uh, why do we communicate our research, right, in the first place? Uh, what's what's the, the, the reason behind that? And unfortunately, in privileged academia, right, because of, of uh, the complexity of the metrics and and scholars getting obsessed, um, ensuring that they meet expectations, they meet the, the minimum required number and quality of, 
of articles, um, it, it has become for, for many academics of, uh, their way of life, right? So, so academia for them has equated to essentially uh, publishing these articles in top journals. And, 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 and then it kind of raises then the questions like, oh, so what is the purpose of publishing really? And why are you communicating it in the first place? And what would say, you know, a critical scholar would say that these days uh, for, for um, uh, institutions, privileged institutions that are plugged into neoliberal academia uh, is very much uh, obsessed with that to the point that scholars main objective for publishing their work is essentially to meet these metrics, right? But we all know that, of course, it goes beyond that, right? You publish these um, papers not because you want to advance your career as a scholar. Part of the story is that for those who are under pressure to do so. But of course, you know, asking more, more of the moral question of why do we actually do this in the first place uh, is, 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 is an entirely, you know, uh, there's a vast uh, um, number of answers to that, right? And, and one of which is, is, of course, you know, I mean, uh, most of us use public funds to do this research. Hence, we need to give, um, we, need, we need to give it back to the public, right? So, so to a certain extent, it's a public good, right? Um, so whatever that we produce in our research, um, we communicate that in the hopes that whatever that we found in our research would somehow somewhat benefit uh, society, right? So that's sort of kind of the, the, the bigger, uh, I guess, uh, kind of the moral question behind the question of why do we publish in the first place? Um, uh, next uh, slide, please. So, um, so one of, another question that's really important to ask here is who do we communicate with? And, and, and now we're kind of getting into the, the heart of, of this, this talk, which is you know, um, kind of making a case for why it is important for us still to actually be communicating with scholars outside uh, the local context. Um, and so uh, the question of who, who, who we communicate with uh, can somewhat be uh, uh, connected to that, the, that context that I talked about a while ago, right? that if you are more connected to neoliberal academia, uh, to, to privileged academia, there's more of that capacity and, 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 and impetus for you to communicate your work with, uh, with the broader academia, right? To communicate your work with scholars who are based in other parts of the, the world. Um, and and just, just because that's the nature of, of um, uh, of, of the research enterprise to begin with, right, in, in, in privileged academia. But in the Philippines, it could be a different story, right? Um, who you communicate with would, would most likely be answered by, of course, people who are based in the Philippines. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there's less of that impetus to, uh, to um, get something out, right? To write something, uh, to communicate something. Um, uh, you know, in conversation with other scholars outside the country, right? So, so we'll get more into that later on because that's the, that's the heart of the question. So the other question, part of the, so it's sort of a three-part question, right? So the third question here is how do we communicate then? So there are various forms of doing that. And I'm not gonna tackle that in my talk because I believe in this series, there's gonna be a, a, a presentation that's solely focusing on, on the various, um, platforms and venues where you can communicate your work. Uh, but the, this is just to list some of the, the, the popular ones, right? And of course, the most academic ones are, you know, uh, presenting them in conferences, uh, in academic workshops, writing a monograph, write a book, um, uh, a book length uh, publication, journal articles, right? Either they're local, international or regional. Yes, yes, um, special issues. So I mean, these are you know, specially designed and curated uh, journal articles uh, uh, put together in a particular volume. And then you have, uh, then you have, uh, you know, as you go down the list, you know, uh, it becomes less of academic, right? Less serving academia in that sense. Kind of, um, you know, it could be, for example, a policy brief or giving a giving a presentation to policymakers. It's a form of communicating your uh, your research. 
to, to things that are more public facing, right? Editorials, for instance, doing radio interviews, doing town halls, right? So if your research uh, concerns a particular community, then you do, you call for a town hall uh, and uh, call for a meeting for people to attend that town hall. And then, and then you then you communicate the results of your research to, to the people of that community, right? To, um, they could also be um, uh, more creative, right? So they could be translated in, forms of, in the form of documentaries, art exhibition, comics. So I'll show you an example of that later on. But then again, this is not really at the heart of my, my, my talk for today. Um, uh, somebody else will talk about this uh, in the near future. Uh, next slide, please. So let's go back to the question of who do we communicate with? And um, uh, in the Philippines, if I were to ask you that question, who do you communicate with? You know, for, for those who are um, uh, part of uh, uh, your respective institutions in the Philippines, you know, when you have a research uh, project and then, and then after analysis and you've come up with your results, right? How do you, who do you communicate the results with? And in, in some cases, you know, because I've um, collaborated and I've worked with uh, a number of um, scholars who are based in state universities in the Philippines. And one of the unfortunate things that I see is that uh, many of these uh, research projects end up, um, writ uh, they, they get written up as reports that end up in somebody's uh, desk or shelf and they just gather dust there, right? And, and they, don't, they don't see the light of the day, so to speak. So, um, so you know, I mean, it, it just becomes like a part of a bureaucratic process, right? So let's say the university gives out research funds and then, uh, and then uh, a group of scholars within that university, say a state university takes, uh, uh, takes that money, right? To do the research. And then part of that requirement is for them to write a report that they submit to the university. And they do that, right? But the unfortunate thing is in, in many cases in the Philippines, it ends up there, right? It, it, that, that's sort of the, the, end, the end goal, right? It's like you write the report and then and uh, who knows uh, who actually reads these reports, right? Or, or if they actually get read at all, okay? But, but the point is that uh, it just ends up in somebody else's shelf or desk, right? And it got, gathers dust there and that's it, right? And nothing else happens. So that is, that's the sort of thing that, that happens quite often in the Philippines. Uh, but but there, of course, there are many uh, other examples of local scholarship that, that were particularly done well and, and, and the purpose of which is to be communicated with local people, right? So, so the purpose is that you do research uh, by locals for the scholars, right? So some of the uh, for for the for for local people, and and some of the the books that you see here, for example, are exam are uh, are examples of that, are really good examples of that, right? They're 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 written in in local lingua franca, right? Um, and and these are again funded by public universities, uh, the government, for instance. A few of them are funded by private entities. Um, they translate them into books, they publish them in local journals, right? Local journals that are also managed by local universities in the Philippines, right? So that's great. You know, this, it's a, you know there's a vibrant, there's a vibrant um, activity going on when it comes to uh, doing local research and translating that to local publication. Uh, next slide, please. And, and one of the things that is really fascinating about the Philippines is actually, you know, now everybody's talking about decolonial scholarship. We're, we're, we're actually quite ahead of this, right? So decolonial scholarship started way back in the 1970s and 80s in the Philippines right? with, a, with, a, uh, with the emergence of, of um, fields like Psicologia Pilipino, which is Philippine psychology, and Pantayong Pananaw, which was started by Zeus Salazar, who's a historian uh, based in the University of the Philippines History Department, um, of, of, of really kind of uh, getting into this notion that you do scholarship and the primary purpose of the scholarship for, is for the consumption of 
of, of the indigenous population, right? So it's scholarship done by the indigenous population for the indigenous population. So when, when, when I went to college, I, I went through this, right? It was a required course. Everybody had to take Pantayong Panana, I remember. So it's sort of a, uh, an alternative a narrative of the history of the Philippines told by Filipinos uh, to, to sort of complicate and challenge the narrative that was uh, um, presented to us by mostly white male scholars. Right, or based in the United, United States. Uh, Psicologia on Filipino, you don't learn about Freud or uh, Carl Jung, right, or Skinner. You know, I mean, uh, you learn that when you major in psychology in UP Diliman, but you're required to take Psicologia on Filipino where you are re required to learn uh, concepts that were not developed, uh, that were primarily developed in the Philippines, right, that were not developed uh, in, in, in the West. Okay. So, um, so, you know, you learn about things like what does he mean, right? Um, so, so certain, uh, words and certain behaviors in the Philippines that are very difficult to translate and explain in uh, using, um, um, uh, non, you know, non-local languages, um, to, uh, to, 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 to make sense of these concepts, right? All right, so so there is already that, and, and and I would say that you know there needs to be more. Okay, so this is this is sort of a really important kind of scholarship that's happening in the Philippines, and I would argue that if we could bolster it more, right? But but there's also a bit of a, a caveat, right? It's a bit of a warning that we cannot solely rely on, and we didn't, we cannot say that hey, why don't we shift the whole of academia towards this direction, right? To say that, oh, what if we shift um, the entire Philippine education towards indigenous knowledge production? Um, so there could be some issues with that. And we can talk more about that during the Q&A. But one of the things is, 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 is the, um, uh, the possible pitfall of view of, of this um, area of scholarship that, that you're building, right? Uh, to be very insular and very inward looking. And, and one of the, the potential pitfalls of that eventually is that, you know, um, you lose a sense of reflexivity, right? Or your criticalness towards your, the, the, the very knowledge that you are producing, right? And, and sometimes you get that criticalness and you get that reflexivity by having conversations outside, right? So, so here, the, the, the risk is actually you're building eco, echo chambers, right? So if we're talking about social media, for instance, in Facebook, right? And then you unblock people, I don't like this person, right? And then in the end, you end up, um, you know, interacting with, with people you're just familiar with and people, people who share the same uh, belief systems, the same, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the same ways of thinking, then, then you build an echo chamber. And that's it's exactly what's one of the pitfalls of, of, of a really very nativist form of, of scholarship. But then again, I'm saying that this is, this is an important direction and this is an important type of scholarship in the Philippines and I wish that we could develop this more, right? But, but I'm already slowly kind of building my argument here towards why it is still important for us to, to be um, communicating our work with international um, with the inter with international audiences. Next slide, please. So, okay, so here I'm making a case. Hey, Marvin, uh, sorry, just to say maybe another f uh, couple of more minutes to wrap up. All right, okay, yeah. So I'll breeze through this. Okay, so um, so a case for um, so I'm making a, a quick case for why we need to reach out to the international audiences. So next slide, please. So first is just to um, that seeing how knowledge that is produced in the Philippines could contribute to broader public discourses and not just public discourses happening within the local, right? But public discourses that could actually happen internationally. And this is the example of, of comics I was talking about. So this is my wife's work. Uh, she's, she's writing papers, she's writing a book uh, associated with, with this, but she also uh, took time to uh, find artists to translate their findings into, into this uh, you know, creative form. And, and, and because this creative form resonates more with the public, right? That, that, um, that you know, they post this in social media and then it generates a lot of conversation even outside the Philippines. Next slide, please. 
Then you have official discourses, right? Works on the Philippines, uh, for example, the research has been done in the Philippines, end up in, in actual really, you know, in, in, in official discourses, like in the United Nations, for instance. If you go to the international uh, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change, you read their reports, you would be amazed by the number of research material that actually originate from the Philippines, right? So, so just to show again that the type of scholarship that happens within the country uh, can end up you know, informing broader policy making outside the country. Uh, next slide, please. And then of course, academic discourse, right? Um, there are a lot of theories developed outside the Philippines, right? Um, by social theorists from North America, from, from, from Western Europe. Uh, but I think uh, one important way that um, local scholarship can contribute is to, is to complicate, right? It's not just to say that, hey, these, these theories work in this particular context. I think we need to kind of move beyond that as well. So yeah, maybe they, they're just, we can use the local context as a way to show that these theories are actually uh, you know, uh, good theories, right? But at the same time, we could use the local context as a means to challenge these uh, theories as well. Uh, next slide. And 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 there's so much about the the, the Philippine context, right? So, for instance, um, uh, Harold Conklin, who's a well-known anthropologist based at Yale, uh, learned about the Hanunu uh, um, indigenous group in uh, Mindoro, and that paved the way for an understanding of Sweden agriculture, right, which became quite central to, to agrarian studies, right. So, so the Philippine context, we can really, you know, there's so much about it that could inform scholarship elsewhere, but it would be great, of course, if the scholar who made this was, was somebody from the Philippines as well, right. So um, next slide. And, and, and a really good example of this would be June Aguilar, right? So June Aguilar uh, has done work that sort of uh, attempt to complicate um, uh, dominant narratives of scholarship in say about migration, about family, right? Uh, that are being produced in other parts of the world. And, and, and his goal is to, 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 again, kind of draw from his uh, own research back home and his positionality as a Filipino scholar to, to offer alternative, you know, uh, to offer other narratives. I don't want to call it alternative, but to offer other narratives that could potentially complicate the narratives that are already out there uh, uh, as, as pushed by other scholars in other parts of the world. Um, right, next slide. And I think I'll probably end here. And then we can make this as part of the the Q and A. So you're probably asking the question: So where do we start, right? So we, we can talk about it late, later on, and there are um, many ways, uh, possible ways that we could start, right? Uh, maybe I could just quickly breeze through this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, have a web presence, right? Yeah, um, a lot of you probably know Gideon Lasco. He's a local scholar. He's a medical anthropologist. Uh, one one thing that that they really admire about him, okay. Uh, uh, not talk, regardless of the politics. So the politics is one thing, right? But as a scholar, right, he's, he has a really well, uh, has a strong public presence and he has a strong web presence. So all his research material, he actually, uh, you know, puts it in uh, and, and translates, translates his research work to, to very palatable language uh, on his website, right? As he develops his more academic pieces, uh, there's already some material already uh, incorporated and already presented in his website. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, um, attend uh, conferences if you can. You know, before it used to be quite difficult, but now uh, we can't thank. It's not. It's not uh, right to thank COVID nineteen for that. But uh, but be, 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 but because of the development of. That, of technologies uh, that allow us to do these things virtually, right? It become it has become a, a bit more accessible, right? So before it's so difficult to travel all the way to Europe or to the United States where most of these conferences take place, but now you can actually attend these conferences virtually. Next slide, please. But I also would like to kind of just emphasize that there are many conferences happening uh, in the Philippines, and these are uh, organized by particularly uh, very, very well-connected groups, 
right? So Philippine Studies uh, Conference, right? Uh, UGAT, which is the anthropology group in the Philippines. And, and they always frame their conferences as international. And you do get uh, scholars from outside the Philippines uh, presenting in this particular venue as well. So in this sense, it becomes like a bridge, right? So it's a local, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat kind of a local group, local conference, but that, that is quite connected outside the Philippines. Uh, next slide. I think I probably have like a couple more here, then we can do our Q&A. Um, uh, there are now a, a, a emergence of a number of workshops that are organized by scholars who are particularly attentive to post-colonial and decolonial politics, uh, one of which is the, uh, the Journal of Peasant Studies, organizes every year what they call a right shop. And, uh, and what June Boreas, who is the, um, the editor-in-chief of Journal of Peasant Studies, does is that he, he invites all local scholars, scholars from the region, for instance, and they would jump from one uh, continent to another. Uh, like it used to be in Africa, then, then there was a time it was in Southeast Asia. And then they would uh, invite local scholars uh, to present their works in progress, right? And it's a way for them to sort of penetrate. And some of them do get and do end up being published in the Journal of Peasant Studies, which is a really highly ranked journal. Uh, next slide. And then, of course, you know, we cannot dismiss that there are um, journals in the Philippines as well that are also quite connected internationally, right? The Philippine Studies Journal, for instance, it's not just a local journal that is published by Ateneo de Manila University Press, but many other international scholars who do work on the Philippines actually publish in Philippine Studies Journal. Uh, it's listed in Scopus, it's listed in the databases, right? And then there are uh, numerous um, regional journals as well. And I would say that this, these journals are a good start because it's, in some ways they are a lot more accessible and they're, they're a lot more, you know, um, uh, in, in, in some ways, there's a lower barrier to entry as compared to other more general journals uh, out there that goes beyond uh, area studies. Yeah. Um, final slide, I think. Last slide. And and collaborate. Okay. Be open to collaboration. Okay. One of the the good the um the best things of being a local scholar is that if there are international scholars uh, coming in and wants to do research, right? It's just it's very prudent for them to be actually to actually be working with local scholars, right? So so international scholars are are very much open to doing collaboration these days. But the caveat here is that as a as a local scholar, you have to exert your you have to exert your um your 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 rights, right? That you you can't just be the, the type of collaborator who will be gathering data for your international partners, right? So, so you have to exert your, 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 um, uh, your contribution. And, and, and it's, it, if it's supposed to be a, a truly collaborative process, then you have to be part of the design of the research. You have to be part of the analysis and you have to be part of the writing too, right? So, so highly encourage you to do that. So I think I will end there, okay? Um, there's a bit of a slide here, but I could use the Q&A as a way to kind of uh, give example because I have a, a current project now that kind of gets into some of the points that I that I mentioned here. But 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 let's end here and let's do the the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Marvin. That was really incredible and very insightful. Um, and I think it really sort of it laid out the groundwork, a showing what it is that we will be that especially early career scholars will encounter as they start to go out and start to publish. Um, and and what are some of the opportunities and ways forward that we that scholars will have or could have to you know insert themselves or make themselves visible and heard um yeah and hopefully the rest of the series and the remaining seminars in the series will contribute to continue contribute to that discussion and move that forward so a huge thank you for kicking us off with this seminar with this particular talk as well um uh, we already have one question or in the chat boxes so again to let everyone um, reminding everyone if you have questions please do put them in the chat boxes or if you raise your hand um, using the hand raise function of zoom apologies um, i will keep an eye out for that and i will read out the questions or give you an opportunity to speak the questions out yourself 
Um, so the first question is from Mark. Mark, would you prefer to unmute yourself and just ask the question? Mm, yes, no? uh, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you, Gunjan. Uh, my question, uh, Dr. Marvin, is that um, communicating research and other academic outputs is often done, well, well in the Philippines, by offering uh, monetary incentives. Um, how can publications and other academic outputs be better um, communicated uh, and inculcated in faculty and students? All right, a great question, Mark. And and um, you know, I've been thinking hard about this. Actually, to be honest, um, I'm torn because <laughs> I, I used to be in De La Salle University before, where each each Scopus publication that you publish, you're given money, right? Something like uh, what was the incentive structure again? Something like if you publish, regardless of whether it's in Q1, Q2, or Q3, uh, the ranking of the journal, as long as it's published in Scopus, you get something like. 70,000 pesos per article, right? It's pretty good, okay? And I have to say, you know, I, would, I wouldn't say no to that. It was like, okay, like money, yes, please. But, but I think the other, my other worry there is that um, it does kind of potentially erode uh, intrinsic motivations, right? Uh, like motivations that are associated with what are the reasons why people do publish, right? And, and works, and of course, there's sort of the ideal aspects of that. Which is you are genuine. You genuine, genuinely want to to uh, to share the, the results of your research, right? To share your knowledge with uh, with other people, and 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 I do kind of see the repercussions of that sort of incentive, monetary incentive system, that it's more kind of extrinsic, right? Uh, is that uh, now I'm beginning to see more and more of these scholars whenever they present their work, right? If they get a new publication out. Right, and uh, they will talk about their publication uh, and say that, "Hey, I got a publication out! Uh, hooray!" Right, it got published in this journal. It's Scopus listed. Period. Right, and and, and I was just wondering, is like, what I really wanted to see is like, what was the research about? Right, what was the what was your main findings? And that was never communicated. Right, so so the purpose of communicating it was to let people know that, "Hey, I got published." And I got 70,000 pesos out of this, right? So, so, so th that's sort of kind of an indication then that, hey, you know, it's becoming more of that in extrinsically, extri extrinsically motivated um, incentive structure, right? Which is unfortunate. Um, so there's a lot of debate around this. Uh, some scholars say that maybe it's good to start with that, start with it the incentive structure first, a monetary incentive, incentive structure, and then later on kind of find ways to, to move, to, to transition out of it, right? So, so that people then kind of appreciate more the, the intrinsic values associated with publishing. But it's a tricky issue, I have to say. Um, but but we, we just don't want everything to be just driven by, by extrinsic monetary incentives. Great, thank you so much for that, Marvin. Um, we've got another question. Oh, apologies, I'm just having a quick look. Um, Kitima, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question as well? Yes, apologies uh, thank if I'm you. mispronouncing your name. Yes, thank you very much, um, Katama from Ethiopia. Uh, yeah, nice uh, presentations. As I understand, like identifying the research audiences and uh, uh, sharing to the local scholars and for university academies very central and important uh, however most of the time um, we left out to share the information or the study findings for local community or for the study participants and uh, uh, in contemporary uh, it's advisable get, like to co-produce knowledge with the study participant and to share to the findings for the local community, not for only international scholars, not only for academicians or for the students. Do you have any experience in case of Philippines in sharing information or data to local communities or the study participants, please? Thank you. Right. It's a very good point, really. Thank you for raising that. I think, you know, one of the things that, that one of the, the the issues that could blindside us when we're thinking about communicating our research, especially when we're now looking less inwards and more outwards, is that, right, that we lose sight of that. And I think we shouldn't, right, as, as much as possible, really find ways to, 
to um, to maintain that inward looking part of the research and and to to really be asking the question who is it really for right um, um, in addition to your aspirations to communicate your work internationally right and I always believe that that um, maybe not all forms of scholarship but many forms of scholarship can embody both um, kind of a, a, the a part of it that's more engaged, right? That it's supposed to be benefiting the communities, uh, your research participants, for instance, the, the real, uh, the people who are supposed to really benefit from your research. And then there's also the academic component of it, right? Whether your research actually informs the ways we think about this problem and these issues from a more theoretical and conceptual perspective. And I would say that that is important too. And I think it's it's really important for scholars like us to be to us to strive to actually do both. And it's difficult, it's challenging, I have to say, right? That 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 especially if if the um, the impetus, the, the motivation for you to get stuff published uh, is tied to your your uh, career, right? That you have to do this because partly you have to advance your career. Oftentimes you lose sight of that other side. Right, or the, the engaged part of the research. But I think, you know, as, as scholars, uh, we always should be thinking of these two. And, and back home, actually, we do have a lot of examples of that, of, of people who, are, who manage to be able to do both, right? And I think um, the more that you're connected with your communities, the more you have this sense of that responsibility that you have to get your research you know, communicate it to them and see how you translate your research to benefit them, right? Um, but then again, um, if you do both, right, so there will always be some compromise. So, so you won't be able to publish a lot that is outward looking, for instance, right? And then the moment that you step more into doing uh, publications with a, in, for international audiences, then, then you might lose some time kind of working on the inward. Um, so it's really just striking the balance, I think. And I have to say, though, you know, I, I struggle with that until now. Uh, it's, it's always a challenge, but it's always good to keep in mind that we should be doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that question, Kethema. Um, I've got next question. Alison, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question. <laughs> Uh, hello, this is not my question, actually. This is, uh, this is a question raised by JV of those who. So what do you think is lacking in the academic and research culture in the Philippines? And how do state universities and colleges from the peripheries move forward to increase the research productivity? Right, yeah. I think um, this has... So, so, so a part of that, because we, we, uh, we, uh, I was part of a, a sort, some sort of a movement before, to to help capacitate state universities to engage in in research publication, uh, writing and research publication. And I think there are real barriers along the way, and uh, and these barriers I think are potentially surmountable if 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 um, scholars are given enough. Um, guidance and training right and I think um, it's not just you know it's it's something that should not fall on on the hands of the state universities themselves I think um, uh, more privileged universities in the Philippines or whichever local you know context that you're in right let's say you're in some country in Africa for instance there will always be a gradient of universities right so there are great universities that are more um, uh, privilege, and then uh, there are more. Uh, there are universities also that are uh, that are limited in terms of resources. So um, uh, I think it's also the responsibility of of institutions that are more privileged uh, to be to be um, um, providing some of these guidance and 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 uh, resources and sharing some of their resources as well. I think a bit of that is happening now in the Philippines, but we could definitely do better. Right, um, just like for example, having scholars who are quite well connected internationally are able to publish more, uh, to actually, you know, like um, make it as part of their advocacy, right? To be going to state universities um, in the, in the provinces, for instance, to to help, you know, give give workshops, right? Take on the mentee, for instance, right? Um, and in the workshops, you know. 
believe me, you know, an hour workshop will not cut it, right? It's not, it's not enough, right? It has to be more than that. Uh, and the best, um, usually the best uh, uh, model is that, you know, there's, there's a mentor uh, from, from one of these privileged institutions who's taking on several mentees from, from uh, state universities, for instance, right? And then guiding them through the entire process of, of analyzing data, writing the data, you know, finding a suitable venue uh, to publish that work, right? It's a lot of work, definitely, but I think uh, that, that sort of model has to be done, right? So we can't just rely on just giving short-term seminars, to be honest, because writing is a skill that takes years uh, to develop. Great, thank you so very much for that, Marvin. Um, I realize we're coming to near the, our initial set time to end. However, I wanted to take the privilege of the chair and ask a question, or rather ask a question on behalf of um, Parvati, because she unfortunately had to leave. Um, and it's um, and also to others, if you have any questions, if Marvin doesn't mind hanging on for another couple of minutes after, uh, yeah, in case people have some questions, um, please do put them in the chat. So taking the privilege of the chair, the question is, um, what do you think that the Global North scholars can do to support Global South scholars in this endeavor? All right, yeah. Great, it's a really great question. Um, I think, yes, providing some institutional support would be, would be good. Um, um, is, uh, you know, having these mentor-mentee relationships would be one, right? So. So I know um, a number of scholars from the Global North, for example, who, who, who really advocate for this, right? So they, they find um, uh, budding young scholars um, from, their, um, from, uh, from one country, for example, or from, from a particular institution that has uh, limited resources and takes on that per, um, takes on the, the the role of being the mentor for that person. So I do have I do know of a few examples of that, but I think a really good example would be the, the thing that that for example that um, uh, June Boreas is doing now with the Journal of Peasant Studies, and it would be wonderful for example if many other journals are able to do this and many other institutions are able to do this is to run these workshops right. Um, and write shops, they call them write shops. And the write shop, again, it's not just an hour workshop, right? It's like, you, you know, you sit with these scholars for the entire summer, right? So you, you, you assemble them together and then they come together for a week or two, right? And which is fairly easy now because everything now could be done online, right? But then, then you assign mentors along the way and then you help them kind of work through their papers along the way as well. Um, the Asia Research Institute at NUS sort of does that, right? So they have their, they call it the Graduate Research um, Fellowship. So they, they um, invite um, scholars from, from different parts of the region um, to, to come over to Singapore. So traditionally it was really flying these scholars to Singapore and they would spend a couple of months here. And the purpose of which is really just to develop the skills to write, right? And, uh, and then what they do is then they assign professors here at NUS to be mentors for these graduate students. Um, and these are just a few examples. I'm sure there's probably several more, but if we could creatively think of ways to really um, leverage on the resources of our institutions in the global north to provide um, opportunities like this, uh, I think that would be great. Yeah, uh, kind of more longer term um, and, and, and making sure that these engagements are really meaningful. Right. Thank you so much for that, Marvin. Um, and just to add quickly, the, the origins of this seminar series, in fact, lie in one of our initial efforts, which was we had managed to get some funding to run workshops with African scholars, um, mm. particularly early career scholars, to develop a set workshop, but also a longer term collaboration on um, writing academic papers for the purpose of aimed at, you know, um, British journals um, mm. as opposed to local journals. But then we had to postpone everything or rather we we're still hoping to have that because this was supposed to be in 2020. Right. Um, but we've tried to sort of maintain that online, but it's been really challenging. 
Mm. Um, so despite the benefits that online offers, we've also found it extremely challenging because people just, you know, you get busy, especially in the last couple of years. So managing workloads and things like that, um, lots of the members of the group have found that really struggled a lot with it. So we're still trying to keep everyone's motivations up. <laughs> I, I heard the Journal of Peasant Studies um, did something like that because their their last uh, the runs uh, the last couple of runs right it was uh, were during the pandemic so so everything was online and they they faced the same challenge as well I think so there were some uh, participants who dropped out uh, mm. along the way right so 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 yeah so I think we just have to find ways there is still something about that right being able to do it in person. That actually uh, that that, uh, that that can really help sustain that motivation, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, we have one more comment, uh, and then my apologies again if I'm mispronouncing your name, Chanel. Chanel. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm reading the comment now. Yeah. Okay. I just thought if you wanted to say it out loud, but that's fine if you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, one 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 possible way of doing this is um, if if more of of the scholars from uh, from state universities, for example, state universities and colleges in the Philippines, to to attend um, uh, local conferences and regional conferences, uh, and then establish some of the the. the those collaborations within those conferences. I think that would really help. Um, uh, from what I hear is that increasingly, for example, local conferences in the Philippines, like the ones that are associated with uh, disciplinary associations, right? It's like, for example, the Philippine Sociological uh, Association or the Philippine Political Science Association. Uh, before, when they organized these conferences, it, uh, it was always kind of having it always in Manila, right? In the, in the uh, in the the capital city, and then not everybody is able to attend, right? Because it can be quite expensive for some institutions. So um, so now they've taken it. The um, some of these organizations are are uh, rethinking that model, and what they're doing now is they're bringing the conferences now to provinces, for instance, right, and outside Manila, uh, and then and that allows more um, uh, institutions to attend. And, 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 and that then can be a, an opportunity, you know, the wonderful thing, and, and, and perhaps it's something that we're missing now because of the pandemic and everything is online, is that you can really forge um, strong relationships during conferences. You know, uh, when you meet a person, uh, you know, when you, have, when you sit together with this person over coffee and then just talk about possibilities for collaboration, you know, a lot of, a lot of my, my collaborations uh, in the past were established during conferences, I must say, right? So, so if ever that model comes back again, that we're able to, to see meet in person, unfortunately, it's much more difficult in Zoom because once you say, this is the end of the session, that's it, right? So the, the Zoom platform closes and that's it. There's no opportunity to meet. But once we get that opportunity to meet again, uh, attend the conferences and, 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 and that would really be, I think, uh, I, my, my sense is that many scholars uh, in, in more privileged institutions uh, would, would be willing to, to, to serve and, and, and provide more um, uh, you know, opportunities to share their resources and time. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that, Marvin. And just a follow up point on that Zoom that, you know, once you click and it sort of all disappears, um, I would encourage I, not to speak on behalf of you or others, but I would encourage particularly early career scholars to, in, especially in this environment, to just take the initiative and contact the speakers or contact a person that you think you would want to, you know, just even if it's just to introduce yourself. I know I've done that in the past as a PhD student where I don't really care, so I would just email people. Right. Worked out more or less. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you be yeah. It's 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 about not yeah. It's recognizing that we are just we're people, and we've all been sort of through these processes. So yeah. do take the opportunity, you know, if there is a person to contact them and just follow mm. up. Um, as we say, even if it's just to say hello and introduce yourself, because mm. if you're going to be part of sort of this community, this is a much larger community. 
Um, and a lot of it's dependent on you just saying hello sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You'd be surprised how you, know, you think that, you know, doing, doing something like that, you know, mm -hmm. would be futile. You know, you'd be surprised how, how some so scholars respond to. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, generously. <laughs> right. There are all of those few who I feel, okay, fine. But then those might also not be the ones who would appropriately, who, you know, you might fit and work, match with to work with. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, but again, not to speak on behalf of anyone else, except just. All right. yeah. but, but given that, given that, feel free to, to send me a note, you know, send me an email if you'd like to, if you have additional questions, if you want, just want to chat about certain things, you know, related to what we talked about today. Great. On that note, I think it's time to then bring this session to a close. Thank you so very much, Marvin, for all your um, taking all the questions. And thank you, everyone, for attending and for the questions and the discussions that we've managed to generate. Um, hopefully, we'll continue to move forward with that. I think I'll hand over to Elson to bring the session to a close. All right. Again, thanks so much, Marvin and Gunjan. Thank you also. And for everyone who attended uh, this session, we hope to see you again by the first Thursday of March. So um, can we have a picture? Yeah. 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 Yes, please. <laughs> please open your camera, everyone. Can I? Okay. Okay. Say cheese. Cheese. All right. So once again, thank you, everyone, and thank you for your time. Thank you for the invitation, really, and then all the best to everybody. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you.